Thanks so much for joining us for CBN News Today. I'm Ephraim Graham. Churches often spend years and money trying to reach their communities for Christ. Now a group of congregations in Lexington, Kentucky, have found a simple winning formula straight from the Bible. As Paul Strand reports, the main ingredients are unity and a love for others. Many congregations realize they make no impact until they reach outside their own walls. Then when they take action, it usually turns into a competition. But what if a number of different churches decided to band together for the greater good? This may look just like a patch of grass in one of the poorer neighborhoods of Lexington, Kentucky, but pretty soon it's going to be a church, and a church that can exist only because 16 to 20 other churches all come together with a common purpose. That purpose is a pledge to help the homeless and other poor hurting people. For 10 years, they've taken turns forming this temporary church by worshiping and performing acts of service in the inner city. Those acts range from free medical exams or advice to haircuts to boxes of donated clothes, all followed by a big feast so everyone leaves full, both spiritually and physically. Uh, we have a lot of really good ministers. Uh, we have some really good music. The food is excellent. Charlie Younger has preached here for years. God just pretty much uh, put on my heart that uh, it was important for me to give back just a portion of what he has so graciously given to me. He relates to the hard times many of these folks go through. I was homeless once. I lived in the front seat of my pickup truck for a while when I was uh, uh, in active alcohol. Uh, and, uh, but that's been a while back. God brought me out of that. Now he shows God can do the same for them. This is called Church Under the Bridge, which is sort of funny since there's no bridge in sight. It was actually named by one of the founders who saw a similar ministry in Austin, Texas that did take place among the homeless under a bridge. Really, anybody can end up in a situation where they need help. Michael Windhorn has served for seven years and says Church Under the Bridge emanates a crucial message. Christ's body and, and Christ's love really goes beyond just what happens between some church walls. I just felt so blessed in my life to have what I have, and so just to be able to give back a little bit, it's good. Kristen Ray makes sure her teenage children always take part. It's funny because sometimes they don't really want to come, but then after they've been, they're like, oh, so I'm so She's gratified to see the changes in her kids, like the day her daughter gave away the earrings she was wearing. This lady just fell in love with these earrings, and my daughter just took them off and gave them to her. It was kind of a new thing. Eric Ogle knows what it's like to suffer from homelessness. I got arrested. The first time I got homeless. Then I'll uh, be six months in jail. But Church Under the Bridge transformed his life. Uh, I've been going here about seven years now, and then I changed as a person spiritually. He says many who come here have serious problems. Here they find a doctor or nurse to help them out, and other forms of aid and comfort. Sometimes it's as small as a peanut butter, gel, a peanut butter jelly sandwich and a, and a roll of toilet paper. But, you know, any, any little bit helps and, and helps to lift their spirits. And at least for a couple of hours, Lexington can witness churches act in unity to show a pure love. Uh, I think sometimes we get a little too um, worried about denominations or dogmas. And uh, I think that uh, this is an excellent example of how churches can work together. Jesus told us Christians to have unity and to show love. Well, maybe Lexington's Church Under the Bridge can be the bridge to show us how to get there. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Lexington, Kentucky. Pastor Saeed Abedini is spending another Christmas in an Iranian prison, so he recently wrote a Christmas letter to his family and supporters. The letter was released by the American Center for Law and Justice. Pastor Saeed Abedini writes, we should be able to tolerate the cold, the difficulties, and the shame in order to serve God. We should be able to enter into the pain of the cold, dark world. Then we're able to give the fiery love of Christ to the cold, wintry manger of those who are spiritually dead. This week, CBN News spoke with the ACLJ's Jordan Seculo about the possibility of Pastor Saeed's release. You know, I, I think that we have to carefully monitor the U.S. Uh, negotiations with Iran. And I would take today's news, you know, when, when Alan Gross, the uh, American who was being held in Cuba for nearly uh, three years, uh, or more than that, since 2009, uh, so five years, and, uh, and you, so you just don't know what's going to happen when you wake up. You've got to keep doing the work that you do, uh, that we do, to get Saeed home. And, and we ask people to continue to pray. And when we, when we have a specific action item for them, uh, that they still take part in that. Because, 
uh, as today's news shows about another American who was wrongfully held uh, by a country. You just don't know what 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 efforts are going to be successful. Uh, and, and so you've got to keep doing everything you can. And we believe that's our duty as Christians, that we take every resource we can possible to, to do uh, the smart things to get Saeed home. Now to see our entire interview and learn about ways that you can help Pastor Saeed, log on to CBNNews.com. When it comes to faith, Europe has been called the new dark continent. Church attendance is very low, especially in the official state churches. But revival has come to some German churches in an unexpected way. Dale Hurd reports now from Berlin. Parts of Germany are among the most godless areas in the world. Polling shows that belief in God in the old East Germany is only 13%. But church attendance is growing here, thanks to former Muslims from Iran. At the House of God's Help in East Berlin, Persian converts to Christianity have doubled the size of the congregation. Deaconess Rosemary Gertz. It came like an unexpected summer rain. Suddenly, new people started coming every week and asked to be baptized. In the beginning, only five or six Iranians came. They were easy to spot, and we got to know them. And there, over time, they brought their friends and neighbors. Germany has experienced a surge in Islam this year. Muslims conducted a nationwide campaign to give away Qurans in a country that has largely turned its back on biblical Christianity. But Iranian immigrants, or Persians, have already experienced the darkness and oppression of Islam in their native land. And they're hungry for the freedom and joy of Christianity. Michael asked that we disguise his face to protect his family in Iran. I met a few times with friends in Tehran, in an underground church in a flat. And there we spoke about Jesus. And we tried to do a Bible study sometimes without an actual Bible. All of the Persians we talked to accepted Christ in Iran and then had to either flee or risk prison or death. I was on my way to a house church meeting when I saw police outside the flat. So I didn't go in. And later, I called my mother. She said, the police were here looking for you. So my family helped me flee the country. When I was in Iran, I wanted to become a Christian. But it's really difficult to learn about Christianity in Iran. It's forbidden for a Muslim to become a Christian. It was really difficult. I had to leave my parents. So I lost my home and my family. Rosemary says the Persians were surprised to find so many Germans disinterested in Christianity. Most of them became Christians in Iran and know more about Christianity than you would expect. They're ahead of us in a sense because they have already been persecuted for Christ. And they figured out pretty quickly that a lot of Germans are Christians in name only. And they're disappointed that Germans take religious freedom for granted. Some Germans are suspicious of the conversions because being baptized can help a refugee stay in Germany rather than be deported. So Sister Rosemary takes the Persian converts through a rigorous schedule of Bible classes. I did suspect that some of them just wanted to be baptized so they could get their residency in Germany. But that has turned out to be the case with only a few. In fact, some of them who've already been baptized have come back to our faith and baptism class for the first time. It's not known how many Persian immigrants have converted and joined churches in Germany, but it has become a nationwide phenomenon and is numbering in the thousands. At the House of God's help, it has reinvigorated the congregation. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Berlin. Some of our American beauty contestants and winners visited Jerusalem recently as part of a trip to show the real face of Israel to celebrities in the hope that they'll spread the truth about the Holy Land. CBN's Annika Kopp has the story. Pageant winners usually take the spotlight, but recently these beauty queens traveled to the place that's often the center of the world stage. Through this experience through visiting Israel, people, including this delegation, understand what is the connection of the Jewish people to this land. The trip here to Jerusalem for the group was a first visit. For some, it was a profoundly moving experience. Actually, right now, I feel like I'm in a state of euphoria, like my hands feel tingly, I feel weightless still. I was just at the prayer wall, and um, it was 
was just really emotional. Jerusalem has been transforming, cleansing, um, by far the most beautiful experience of my whole life. Ariel Bullstein leads the Face of Israel, which invited the pageant winners to visit. People who win those titles, Miss America or Miss the United States, they are very important because they are a, a media in their own. They have a hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter, on Facebook. Their opinions really matter. They said the trip had changed the perspective of the country, and now they're going back with a new message. Nobody really knows the truth and really what is over here, so I would love to be able to go back and talk about it and say, no, you need to come visit, like you need to go see it, you shouldn't be so afraid. I grew up in Alabama where I never never feared for my safety going to school every day, never, I've never even seen a bomb shelter. Um, so being here was very eye-opening and I think that now that all of us have experienced it, we understand that there's so much more going on in this country besides that. The highlight of the trip was praying at the Western Wall for the first time. I'm a Christian and so just like feeling like the stones where Jesus has been and I just like felt his presence there so much and knowing that he's a miracle worker and that like our our prayers are important to him. So many tears, I'm going to start crying now. It was the most beautiful experience in my whole life. And I just wish more people could come here. You can see the number of prayers that are put in there. And you know, and then you look around the whole wall and you realize that actually the, the hopes and prayers of the whole world are here in this place. And what affected them the most? Israel is a different world and it's taken me by surprise. And it's definitely something that's changed my life is getting to see all of this amazing stuff that you've always read about and heard about, but now actually getting to see in person. It's really something I'll remember for the rest of my life. Today has been the most life-changing experience that I've that I've had, and Christianity is something that is very new to me in the last uh, year or so, and so to be here, it's only furthering those beliefs. To see the Bible come to life in front of your eyes is just something that you can't explain. Annika Cobb, CBN News, The Old City, Jerusalem. Choirs perform Handel's Messiah all over the world this time of year, but how much is known about this work and the man behind it? Mark Martin traveled to London to learn more about this devout Christian composer and his work that transcends time. For many, Christmas wouldn't be complete without witnessing or taking part in a performance of Handel's Messiah. From the Virginia Symphony in the U.S., to the heart of the Holy Land, Jerusalem. It is felt across the globe. To learn more about the gifted composer of Messiah, our journey takes us to Europe. German-born George Frederick Handel moved into this house on Brook Street in London, England in his late 30s. Handel considered himself an opera composer, but public interest was waning in England, and by 1741, a discouraged Handel wondered if retirement was near. Some people do think that, that um, at this point he was, it was kind of like a, a career crisis really and that it's quite possible that he was thinking of returning to Germany. That's when this man, Charles Jennings, handed him the words or libretto of Messiah. Jennings, a literary scholar, carefully selected Old and New Testament scriptures documenting prophecies about the Messiah, Jesus' birth, death on the cross, and resurrection. The Christian message is, is in part also a response to the kind of growing interest in what is known as deism. Since the deists did not believe in the divinity of Christ, Jenin sought to counter that thinking. For Jenin's, I think Messiah was a very personal passion, a very personal mission. Um, Jenin's was a deeply religious man, um, a very committed Christian. We find uh, Jennings writing to another friend of his, uh, saying, uh, I've done this scripture collection for Handel, and I hope he will expend his best efforts on it so that it becomes his best oratorio, because it's certainly on the best subject. The subject is Messiah. Here is Handel's composition room, where he is believed to have composed Messiah. He wrote the oratorio in only 24 days. Many believe it was divinely inspired. Oh, 
One music scholar described the number of errors in the 259-page score as incredibly low for a composition of its length. Handel reportedly never left his house during those three weeks, and a friend who visited discovered him sobbing with intense emotion. After he wrote the Hallelujah Chorus, reports quote him as saying, I did think I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself. For Jennings and Handel, Messiah would be an evangelistic tool to share the gospel with the masses. They even made the controversial decision to perform Messiah in theaters instead of churches to reach a wider audience, including the performers themselves. Handel used secular singer-actresses to perform the solos, such as Susanna Maria Sibber, a woman with an adulterous past, but who was described as being able to penetrate the heart with her voice, when other more skilled vocalists could only reach the ear. He touches people on every possible level, whether it be on a spiritual level or, or musical level or dramatic level. There's something in Messiah for everybody, and, and of course, for an audience. If you look at the YouTube flash mob hallelujah choruses, you will see that hits are currently running at about 43 million. Now, I doubt if all those people are Protestant Christians. And if you just watch some of those flash mob hallelujahs, you can see in, you know, the people listening in the shopping mall and so on, you can see the change coming over their faces as they listen, and they are greatly moved. Performances were often benefit concerts to help release people from debtor's prison and provide for orphans in London's well-known Foundling Hospital. One scholar wrote, Messiah has fed the hungry, clothed the naked, fostered the orphan more than any other single musical production in this or any country. However, George Frederick Handel did not want the credit. At the end of Messiah, Handel wrote the letters SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, which means, to God alone, the glory. Mark Martin, CBN News, London. It's the most wonderful time of the year, and by it, we mean Christmas. New York City lights up with Christmas trees, Christmas lights. And you can't help but notice the famous window displays. Macy's is not only well known for the parade of all parades, but also for its window displays. Holiday onlookers can't help but notice the glittering decor. Here in the city makes me feel like a little kid. Everything is great, lights are beautiful. One of this year's windows tells the tale of Alex, a young boy with a magic telescope who experiences Christmas on other planets with his dog, Bella. This story comes to life using 3D and high definition features. Another connection that Macy's has with Christmas is the 1947 film, Miracle on 34th Street. Now I wanna do some investigating and find out who knows the film associated with where we're standing right now. What holiday film is associated with Macy's and Christmas? Uh, I need uh, my wife's help on this. Adrian? <laughs> we got a lifeline here. What film is associated with Macy's and Christmas time? Miracle on 34th Street? Yeah! yeah. What film is associated with Macy's and Christmas time? Uh, actually, I don't I have no idea about that. It's a blank on 34th Street. Blank on 34th Street? I'm not sure. I don't know. Either. Miracle on 34th Street. No? Oh. <laughs> I need an NYPD group answer here. Is associated with Macy's and Christmas time. Miracle on 34th Street. Yes. Okay. See, not everyone knows that. Miracle on 42nd Street? 42nd Street? I don't know. What is or 34th Street? 34th Street. Okay. okay, you got it right. After looking at all these window displays, I cannot decide which one is my favorite. But whether you're in the city, a suburb, or in the country, I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas and God bless. I'm Angela Zadipek, CBN News, New York City. Thanks, Angela. An Indiana nursing home is fighting back after pranksters, pranksters stole their two-foot baby Jesus statue 
and then returned it four hours late, four days later rather. Now their baby Jesus is going high tech with a tracking device. A New York based company Brickhouse Security is donating several GPS monitors to the retirement home. That other nativity figures will be fitted with the tracking device as well. Well, finally this hour, a couple of Sacramento police officers are being applauded for helping a family in need. Last week, they saw a family of five standing outside in the cold and rain. When they got out to investigate the situation, they learned the family had fallen on hard times and had no place to sleep. We just said, hey, would you guys be okay if we put you in a hotel room for the night? These officers are amazing. So these officers paid for the family to stay in a hotel using their own money. They were reimbursed through an initiative called Sarah's Program that offers assistance for situations like this one. But the officers say reimbursement or not, they wanted to lend a hand. The true spirit of Christmas indeed. That's going to do it now. For CBN News Today, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. Thanks so much for watching. Merry Christmas.